Hey everybody! Um, I am trying desperately to catch up on some commissioned reviews. I have quite a backlog at this point, and this is one of the ones that has been waiting for a while, and it took me a while to get through it. So, I was actually commissioned to review a video game. Thankfully, uh, an older one, because if you have been around this channel a while, you probably remember me saying, I don't have anything newer than a PS3, and I don't intend to get anything newer than a PS3. The primary reason being, I don't have time to game anymore. A fact which has been reaffirmed by how long and how many sessions it took me to finish this game. To be fair, it's not a short game, it's an RPG, so, you know, there's some time to be sunk into it, but, you know, for how many months it took me to get into it, get buried in other stuff, come back to it, yeah. I'm sorry this took so long, but Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door, I had never played it before. Now, I did have some history with the Mario RPG games in general. I played through the original Super Mario RPG on the SNES, God, multiple times, ages ago. I still got my copy packed away somewhere. I played the first Paper Mario game on, uh, I believe it was on the N64. Um, I didn't go for Thousand Year Door, largely just because I thought that the first Paper Mario game was just fine. It was fine. It was, it was okay. And I wasn't enthused enough to go in for the sequel. Um, and I've played some of the other stuff since then. I've played some of the Mario and Luigi games, like on the, uh, on the GBA. God, I'm so freaking old. Um, I think about as far as I got with that was I got as far as Bowser's Inside Story, which was on the DS. Uh, again, old and dated, but I'd never done Thousand Year Door before. And I'm, I'm going to have to do some explaining because since it's an older game, I don't know how many people are, certainly if you're not as old as I am, are even familiar with it or what Mario RPG used to be like before things like Sticker Star, Origami King, etc. So it is a GameCube game, and it is done in this sort of 2D paper crafting style, which honestly has aged really, really well. I was stunned at how good this thing still looks. And that really does, I think, in a lot of ways, speak to the benefit of going for stylized over insisting on being cutting-edge graphics. Because you know what? Trying to be cutting-edge dates something really, really quick. Going for a specific style and nailing it, even if it's relatively low-tech, that's going to hold up. And visually, this definitely does. So the way this sort of game works is that it is, it is an RPG at its heart. You're going to be moving between worlds, you're going to be leveling up, you're going to be acquiring new party members, you get into combat, and that's a whole other screen. You're going to be solving puzzles, fetch quests, bosses, the works. And there are some little quirks with the way that it being Mario specifically plays into it. First of all, obviously, the uh, the characters who appear on the worlds explored and the whole vibe is Mario. So that's determining the, you know, beyond the visual styling of the paper crafting, that is determining the kind of world that you're playing with, the kind of characters that you are encountering. Uh, the main part that has the most RPG-ish feel to it uh, is the combat. And, um, and like I said, there's leveling and there's some other stuff. I'll come back to that. Actually, you know what? I'll do that first. I'll come back to the combat. So leveling up is kind of interesting in the way they do it. Functionally, um, it's not super different, but it is kind of interesting to me that it takes a hundred experience points to level up. That never changes. It's just every time you go up a level, the amount of experience you get from certain enemies goes down. So you can't just keep grinding in the same area over and over and over again and like get over leveled to heck because eventually, you know, there you you would have to grind through a hundred fights and it, no, it's not <laughs> it's not that important to try and grind up to a higher level. But the other thing is it does not automatically increase base stats for defense, attack, health, uh, flower points, which are the equivalent of mana or magic points. Instead, what it does is it gives you the option to increase one of three things. Your hit points, your flower points, or your number of badge slots. Now, the badge system is where your customization comes in. Because it's through that that you are able to 
because you find throughout the game, you find or acquire or purchase or whatever, these badges which do things like up your attack, up your defense, up one of those stats at the cost of the other, enable you to have certain specific special moves in combat, give you resistance to certain things, increase your hit points or your flower points if you find yourself in a situation going, ah, I need this higher, but I'm not going to level up for a while. Well, you can dedicate a badge to that. So it does allow for a surprising amount of customization with the way that the badge system works. And because of the pace at which you level up, you're never really able to just cheese it and get and equip every badge. Like, you're never going to be able to do that. You're always having to balance what do I need, what don't I need. And while you might have a preferred loadout, you're going to find yourself in certain situations where you're like, what I have isn't working. I need other stuff. Swap that out. Give me this. Do that. And then you move forward. Um, and that's all pretty well. But then there's the combat. And this is kind of my sticking point. Now, the combat actually does have some interesting twists to it and some nice things um, going on with it. The way the combat works is, first of all, you when you're moving around an area, you can see the enemies. So it's not like random battles in old school Final Fantasy where the camera just suddenly zooms in and you're fighting something you couldn't see again. So you see it there. So theoretically, you can try to avoid it. That's hard because most of them, when they see you go in, uh, for you, and a lot of them are faster than you are, but you have the opportunity to either jump on them or hit them with your hammer, which, and if you manage to do that, that means you strike them first. You actually get first hit in the fight. If they manage to hit you before you do that, though, they will get first fight. And if you uh, first hit in the fight, and if you just wander into each other and neither was actually attacking at the time, then it just starts as normal. You, them, you, them, nobody gets a bonus, anything. Um, so that's the way that it starts, and that's kind of neat. The actual presentation is actually kind of fun and quirky because you end up fighting on a stage, um, like for a play, and there's an audience uh, of like NPCs and support characters uh, filling it out. And when you land hits well, because one of the features of this franchise as a whole has been if you hit buttons either in a certain pattern or with the right timing, you do extra damage or for certain special moves for them to really work properly at all. You need to hit this proper sequence or match this to this at the right time. And that sort of uh, thing means that it never uh, it never becomes the just uh, just click your way through attack and just get through this dang fight the way that more traditional RPG, uh, turn-based RPG fights can end up being. And that's both a bug and a feature, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Because what it means is, especially when you are um, slogging through some of the fetch quests of this thing, or if you find yourself in a position where you're going, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next, or you only have a vague idea and you're having to comb through these areas trying to figure out what the heck you're supposed to do to move the plot forward, which happened to me more than a few times, but I'll come back to that. That means that every fight you get into, even one that you are massively overpowered for and you should by all rights be able to wipe the floor with them, you still have to engage and pay attention because if you don't time your attacks and defense right, then it's going to drag on for longer than it needs to. Best case scenario, worst case scenario, if they're an enemy, even a lower level one that has any kind of status ailment stuff, that could chip away at your health and all this other stuff. And this is the other thing. And I'm sure some people are going to tell me, well, if you just do bleh, whatever, look, there are not nearly enough item slots in this. Items don't stack. So I forget how many item slots you start with, but however many you have, that's how many you get to have. So if let's say it's 10, if you get 10 healing mushrooms, that's the whole thing full. They don't stack on top of each other. So what that means is the things that you have to aid you in combat, be they items, be they ways to uh, up your, you know, recover health, recover flower points, you can... <sighs> You can theoretically burn through them very quickly, or you end up finding stuff that you can't hold on to because your inventory's already full, and you can't stock up on a bunch of stuff before a fight. I have little doubt that somewhere in the game, there's probably a side quest or something that I missed that like increases your item uh, capacity. If it's there, and it's a side quest and it's optional, it should be something mandatory because that was kicking my butt all the way through the game how few items I could carry. 
Because honestly, I, maybe maybe I was in the wrong mindset. Maybe it's meant to encourage you to actually burn through them and use them regularly and then go back to the shops and buy more stuff again, but that just works against my natural instinct. My natural instinct in an RPG is to stock up on the stuff that I find and hold on to it until I need it, but that doesn't work here. And I wasn't able to unlearn that and figure out whatever the heck the game actually wanted me to do. So that was a big pain in the butt. And that's especially a pain in the butt when you find yourself grinding through these fights, fight after fight after fight, and especially some of these enemies have really specific immunities, they can only be hit in certain ways, so like a lot of your uh, companions, and because whenever you get into a fight it's you and whoever your partner is, and there's a whole bunch of partners that you can swap uh, in and out of even mid-fight, which is nice, but a bunch of them, if you swap out a partner, that's your that's that partner's turn, was swapping out. Or it's Mario's turn for doing the swap. Like, somebody loses a turn. Either Mario or the partner loses their chance to go by doing the swap out. So, you you can swap them out and that helps, but some of them can only hit uh, enemies at a certain height. Some of them are flying in the air and they have to be jumped on, so only ones like Mario or the little Yoshi that you get can get them. Others are on the ground. And it there's just... There's almost a little too much nuance to the combat in a way that... Whenever I had to go through an old area, big heavy side, because I'm like, I'm going to have to fight these friggin' things. I'm going to get no XP for it. It's still going to be a pain in my butt. And I can't just zone out to get through this to try and find what I'm supposed to find because I have to pay attention. Otherwise, these things still hit me and chip away at my health, which is not very high because even if you pump that up, the actual amount of health you have isn't a lot. So, yeah, the combat really was grinding me down by the end. And I think more than anything, that's what kind of made the game hard to come back to at times. Now, to be fair, there is a lot to recommend the game that isn't the combat. And even the combat can have some clever twists. Like the first boss you fight, you remember how I mentioned there was an audience? Well, a couple things about the audience down front. Uh, the first is, is that if you do things that they like, you know, get the timer right on an attacker, you actually can spend your turn to appeal to the audience. That ups your star power, which is like super special moves. And, um, and there can be people in the audience who are actually against you. You have to keep an eye out for a prompt to go in and kick them out of the audience. Otherwise, like, they'll throw a rock at you and that'll hit you for damage. Sometimes the set at the back of the stage will fall and hit either you or the enemies or both. Um, and in the first boss fight, the boss is this big dragon... And he actually stops midway through the fight, jumps off the stage, and eats a chunk of the audience to regain health. It was pretty funny. And that brings me to the other thing. This game is very funny. And very funny in a way that is very much playing on the notions and the mechanics and the tropes of video games in general and RPGs in specific. So a good example of that, aside from the dragon one that I just mentioned, is that um, there's these black chests. And the first time you find one, you don't know what it is, but you open it and this this thing comes out and it says, aha, you have freed me and I shall now curse you. And it like makes this big deal about how it's this horrible curse. And what the curse is, is that Paper Mario can now fold himself into a pa paper airplane, um, which actually allows him to move, uh, you know, f off specific platforms and basically fly over hazards. In other words, your curse was a new traversal power. And that happens a couple of times, and eventually to the point that the game actually is playing up the fact that you know it's not actually a curse anymore, but it, the the thing still wants you to play along. But it's like, oh, but I, I worked real hard on this. And it's that kind of humor, and it's quite, it's quite entertaining. It's quite fun. What they do with Peach is both funny and bizarre. So Peach gets kidnapped, not by Bowser, by these things called the X-Knots, the actual specifics of the plot aren't worth getting into because it is ultimately Princess Peach kidnapped, um, recover seven star-shaped things, beat final boss. So, like, it's fairly standard even though there are nuances to it. Um, but Peach gets kidnapped and she's on this spaceship and <laughs> when their computer sees her in the shower, it falls in love with her and then keeps coming up with excuses for her to get naked. I'm not kidding. And like, it's, it's bizarrely innocent and like younger kids could even miss that that's what the computer is doing when it, when it says, oh, you, because like it does care about Peach and it's like, 
I want to help you go and change into this outfit so that you're in disguise. Or um, here, take this invisibility potion. Oh, but it doesn't turn your clothes invisible, so better take those off. <laughs> it's 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 pretty cheeky. It's quite interesting. There, um, I'll talk a little bit about the support characters. I ended up not cycling through them all that much. And actually, this is another thing where like there's a little more than there needs to be. Remember how I said you get new traversal? Traversal? Traversal powers as the game goes on. Well, additionally, every single one of your partners that you acquire across the game has some ability that allows you to either uncover or open up certain types of paths. Like, eventually you get a Bob-omb who, if anytime you see a crack in a wall or a building, they can blow it up. Um, the little Yoshi can do the sort of run in midair thing. So if you get on top of him, you can get across, um, you know, larger gaps. Uh, there's uh, a ghost that can sort of blow away if you see it like a little edge of a corner paper, blow that away. It's usually a secret passage, etc., etc., etc. But what was sort of irritating is between all the traversal powers you get and all the partners that you get, I started to lose track of all the things that I could do. And that was uh, one of the frequent sources of that thing where I said, I had moments of, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? And usually it meant I had to use a certain partner ability or traversal power that I either had forgotten I had or hadn't used in a long time or didn't notice the cue, the visual cue in the scene that told me that was what I was supposed to be doing. I had to consult a, an FAQ more than a few times on this, usually just to figure out what the heck I was supposed to do next. The other thing about this is there's an awful lot of um, fetch questing or, you know, basically an equivalent to that. A whole lot of, hey, go talk to this person, they tell you to talk to this person, and tell you to talk to this person, find this person, then come back and talk here. And that kind of stuff drives me nuts. It's the worst kind of busy work in an RPG as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not saying fetch quests can never work, but for me, the way to get a fetch quest to work is if in the process of fetching whatever you need, it brings you somewhere new. It opens things up. So yeah, you're just doing busy work to get something so you can go back, get the information or the item or whatever that you needed in the first place, but you're having new experiences while doing it. The worst kinds of fetch quests are things that send you back to areas you've already been to talk to people you've already talked to in order to get something to bring it back to somebody who you've known for a while. And that's the kind of fetch quest this thing has. The hunt for the bob who is able to set off this cannon that you need to blow is by far the worst example because you literally need to go to every major location in the entire game and talk to somebody who will tell you, oh, he was just here and he left. He went here and then fought, and then ultimately turns out that he ended up going right back to where you started the whole dang thing. Now, obviously that one was probably constructed to be a joke, but it's not funny. It's a slog. You know, making us do all that and going, ha, 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 see, it's like a parody of annoying quests. I'm like, uh, no, it's just an annoying quest. You can call it a parody all you want. It's really annoying. And unfortunately, the game actually has a fair amount of that. That's the worst. And it's not all on that scale, but I got that feeling from a lot of the fetch quests. But as I said, it, it actually got easier for me to keep playing once I hit uh, chapter four which is Twilight Town, sort of the spooky zone. Because that's when the, when the story and the way things were moving forward actually started to be more interesting. Because up to that point, it had largely been go here, you know, talk to everybody in the town, go to the local equivalent of a castle, beat a boss, come back. It was that for about three chapters. Um, well, I guess chapter three was a little interesting because it's like an arena fight and a wrestling thing, which it was fine, but boy, did it drag on too long for how many of those fights you have to go through. I think that's another thing. The, the game has plenty of good ideas that it just hits on for too long. Um, but then once we get to chapter four, we started having interesting wrinkles like, oh boy, this is a spoiler. Well, okay. So th there's a there's a switcheroo and a thing that happens with the boss that was interesting and clever and I didn't see coming. That was quite nice. And it also it also resulted in a former enemy joining your team, which was also a neat uh, thing to to go on. And then later on, you're you're solving mysteries on a train and things just got more intriguing in terms of the structure and what it was you were expected to do, aside from just go to the local equivalent of a castle, fight all the enemies, beat the boss. It was actually the first three chapters that were the hardest for me because they were the most rote. They were the most basic, for lack of a better term. I also feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about one specific character. And this is something that part of me is like, oh, 
oh, and now the part of me is like, eh. So there's a character uh, named Vivian who in the original version, in the Japanese version, is heavily implied to be a trans woman or to be at minimum non-gender conforming because her sisters pick on her and make fun of her and talk about her in masculine terms. And all of that was cut from the English versions. Any possible reference to the fact that she wasn't born a woman or that some people don't consider her to be a woman has been removed. And that's really irritating. I mean, it's, it's freaking poison from, what was it, Final Fight or whatever, all over again. It's, yeah. Uh, but having looked up, you know, what some of the references were, and originally I'm like, oh, yeah, that seems nice. And, like, I'm not shocked we didn't get it, especially for the time when it came out. I'm a little surprised it was ever in there in the first place, but I'm not shocked that it was removed for English audiences. Trying to think what... Oh, so some other fun little things. I feel like I've, I've been registering more complaints than I mean. Dude, there are a lot of little fun things that go on across the game. Um, and especially if you have played any of the Mario RPG games and enjoyed any of them and haven't played this, I would recommend it. Another fun thing is you have chapters where you play as Bowser, quote-unquote, where basically he just stomps his way through original Super Mario Brothers, like NES stages, and he just stomps his way through the whole dang thing. That's cute and fun, and unlike some of the gags that the game does, doesn't outstay its welcome, so that's all nice, and that's fun. Um, I will register one more major complaint. So I didn't beat this game, because after my sixth go on the final boss, <laughs> I, 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 put my hands up before I started throwing the controller. And I'm not a controller thrower as a gamer. I don't get that mad at games as a rule. Not for more than like a real short sort of come on sort of thing. But I'll tell you what, if there is a cardinal sin of RPG bosses, <laughs> it is what I'm about to describe here. It's perfectly fine to have a difficult, multi-stage, long-winded boss that you are expected to barely scrape by. Actually, as a final boss, that's probably what it should be. But if that is what you have made for your final boss, don't have there be, between the last possible save point you can make and the start of the fight, a long, unskippable cutscene that you have to watch every single time you start the fight, and then, before the third stage of the boss fight, another long, unskippable cutscene. That was ultimately why I stopped. Not that I thought I could never beat that boss. I think I probably could have. But what I couldn't do was I couldn't sit through just hitting the button to try and continue the dialogue when it came up, but just slogging through these long, unskippable cutscenes over and over again. That was it. I had to bail, because that was going to break me. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. If you're going to put long cutscenes, they have to be skippable. Please. Ah. But despite my grousing, for the most part, I do like it. And there's a lot of clever design in this. And I can see, especially for Paper Mario fans, why a lot of them feel this is one of the best, if not the best in the series. It did just happen to have a lot of things that irked me personally in the way that the combat worked and the way some of the fetch quests worked. And honestly, some of it might just be me having aged out of this type of game. I have a suspicion that if I'd played it back when it first came out, I would have been more tolerant of... I'm not sure I would have been more tolerant of the combat, but I probably would have been more tolerant of the, well... Here's your clue that will direct you to this town. Now you have to go through and talk to every single person and go into every single building and look for any possible clue for, you know, the traversal powers or what have you. When I was younger, I might have been more okay with that. And maybe it's the fact that I don't have as much free time in my life that makes me uh, just not have the patience for that anymore. Anything that feels like it's wheel spinning and stalling and preventing me from progressing is going to tend to annoy me. And... To be fair, back in the day, it might not have. Certainly not as much. 
But that's Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. I am ultimately glad I played it because there's enough really interesting, cool, funny stuff in it. Um, like, honestly, the humor is really, really good and there's some great meta-style humor across it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Just know what your irritants are. And if they're anything like mine, there are going to be points where this thing grinds on you a bit. But that's Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Have you played it? What do you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Usual stuff. Like, share, subscribe. I have a Patreon through which I was commissioned to play this game. And um, any amount that you're able to put through helps me greatly. You don't have to, though. No pressure. Because we take a relaxed attitude around here. So just come on back next time you need a break.